My name is Fiona Walsh. I'm a solutions engineer at Circle CI. So I deal with a lot of um, like customers coming in, trials, demos, that kind of thing. And before I start on this webinar, I also want to give a plug for our previous webinars. It's a series, so we have ongoing webinars. Um, you can look at our schedule. Sometimes they're every two weeks. Sometimes I think the next one's actually only a week from now. So lots of cool topics. Like so far, three of my colleagues have presented webinars. They're all about an hour in length. And um, the first one was, was Eugene, and it was, was about sort of Circle CI 101 or config.yaml101, where he kind of went into the nuts and bolts of a config.yaml file. And really, it's really good for beginners as well, because he starts off very simple and then even utilizes some cool features of our, our workflows. Then the next webinar was Rose, and she really dove into some of the features of workflows. So she gave really practical examples and like how to's. So that one's also really good. And then just a couple of weeks ago, Ryan, he did one on Docker and containers. So they're all kind of got their own team. And then coming to today, we will talk about um, data persistence. So Circle CI 2.0, it provides a number of different ways to move data in and out of jobs. Um, so we've got the introduction of workflows in 2.0, so that, that gives a, a different way of moving data within a workflow between jobs. So this presentation is try be sort of a guideline, um, like how to use the right task or figure it out um, the one best for you and your bills. So improving repeatability, improving efficiency, but of course, speeding up your bills times. So that's really why we're here today. And this is our, our different sort of sections. And between each section, I'll have a look at the Q&A and you know, I'll call out some questions and answers. Or at the end of the presentation, I also give you a support email where if things don't get answered, you can, you can feel free to say, oh, I had this question um, that came up in the webinar and we'll do our best. We have a really super great support team as well. So workspaces will be our first topic, which is available in our workflows feature. We'll take a look at some uh, common use cases of caching, for example. And then we'll have a look at artifacts. And um, I'll show you where you can see the artifacts tab in the Circle CI UI. So I'll be going back and forth from the presentation to maybe some actual builds. So you can see the things within the, within the actual UI as well in Circle. And then like more kind of broader persistent data in general, we'll be using this diagram and I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's got a lot on it, but we'll be kind of highlighting as we go through each of those three sections, we'll highlight like how is the data being persisting? And so this one will get like sort of filled out as we go into each one. So you can see some are horizontal, some are vertical, some live on, some are very like more short lived. And you'll see that more as we, as we get going. So that's just a, like a, a summary of each one. And I think as you hear it more, you become more familiar because um, with workspaces, really the data only persists within a workflow. So it has a really specific use case. Whereas caching can go between workflows, but it's, it's data between the same job. And artifacts, it's, it's beyond both of those. It can live on further. And then the really, what we're trying to really like bring out in this presentation is like how to use them um, and the amount of time this data will persist really varies. So it's um, trying them out, right? Um, I, I'm European, so I can do a rugby slide, I figure. But um, just like with rugby, in this case, sometimes you just have to do two test cases in your build, time it, maybe use our insights tool and figure it out. Like, okay, that was quicker. You might be kind of comparing workspaces and caching for some like very specific thing. So, you know, 
it's worth a try to just um, experiment. You'll see the nuts and bolts and how to use them. So, you know, you could have a branch, like two branches, one for work, one for workspaces, one for caching, just to see. And it also helps like deeper understanding when we play around with things. So the first one I'm going to talk about is workspaces. And you can see this is, this is, a, this is vertical. Um, so each workflow has an associated workspace that can be used to transfer files to downstream jobs as the workflow progresses. Um, and we use the workspace for data that's produced in a job that needs to be available to the subsequent or downstream jobs. So then these downstream jobs can attach to the workspace. And then what this does when they attach to the workspace, it will download and it will unpack each layer. And that's based on the ordering of the upstream jobs in the workflow graph. And we'll see, like, I'll show specific CircleCI workflow graphs when I head over to each example, we'll see them. And it, it, like a picture is worth a lot of me just like saying words of how things work. I think it becomes um, more apparent when we look at that. So a little bit more about using workspaces. Um, so you declare it in your job. We'll look at the config.yaml as well. Um, and the thing to, to be aware of, each edition creates a new layer in the workspace system. Um, for downstream jobs to use. But downstream jobs can also add more layers on top. And then one of the big difference between workspaces and caching is that workspaces are not shared between runs as they, they no longer exist once a workflow is complete. But there is an exception to this. And you might have noticed in, in 2.0, you have the rerun um, from where it failed option. So that the, how that works is it does use workspaces. So that's just uh, something to know. Um, but just knowing that it's additive only. Um, and just to remind you that after each section, I'll have a look at the Q&A if you guys have any questions. And um, so don't be afraid to type in your question and I'll check them after we um, go to the circle CI UI and have a look at workspaces. So um, between each section, after workspaces, after caching, and after um, artifacts, we'll do that. So let's see. So I think this is more, I mean, really with this slide, it's, it's understanding. I think what's important here is there is an overhead to this, right? No operation is totally free. So it is creating a tarball. It is storing them in a blob store. And then every time you attach a workspace, um, it will need to download and unpack the tarballs balls for every upstream job. So every layer, basically. So that does have an overhead. So we want to minimize how much archiving, uploading, downloading, and unpack operations we do. So that's important. And then this slide, like I have an upstream slide and a downstream slide. And basically, um, it's all one config.yaml, but it just wouldn't fit on my slide. So I just separated it. And it kind of like logically works to put upstream and then downstream. But kind of think of it as one continuous YAML file. So we can see here, um, you know, you start off with your Docker image, just like, like usual. And um, we have this, this flow. This job is called flow. So to persist data. Uh, from a job to make it available to other jobs. We use the persist to workspace key. So you can see that here, persist to workspace. So files and directories that are named in the paths property. You can see paths is, is down at the bottom. And um, they'll be uploaded to the workflow's temporary workspace. And this is relative to the directory. You can see here specified with the root key. So the files and directories are then uploaded and made available for you know, subsequent jobs or, of course, reruns of the workflow. So this is, um, like you see, I'm just creating a directory. And then I'm creating 
a file called echo output within the directory and I'm just putting some text in it. So it's like very simple, um, like basically a directory in a file. <clears throat> and then on the next slide, the downstream, which is the same config.yaml, um, you can see I'm using attach workspace. So that's how we get, that's how we, we um, what's the word, like download those layers, for example. Um, so in this config.yaml, we've got these two jobs. Um, and the downstream job uses the artifact of the flow job, which was the one on the upstream slide. And it's sequential. So in this case, you can see um, towards the, the bottom, like um, the downstream job requires flow to finish before it can start. So that's like a, a pretty like straightforward example of a workflow and how and a workspace within a workflow and how we would use it. Um, in here, I do a, basically, I check the contents of that file and if it matches, in this case, hello world, the build will pass, I'll get a green badge. And if it doesn't, it'll fail. So if any other text was in that file. And so I wanna show an actual example that's pretty similar to this. So I've got, let's see, I've got my circle 101 um, build job. And let me show you the actual workflow view first before we look at like how I used workspaces, which I can click here. It's just called build and test in this case. And so this is like a, a workflow view. And these are all jobs. And these two run at the same time. They run in parallel. So that's just to show you um, how it looks. And as we progress through the examples, I hope to have like, they're a little bit more complex as I go on, but this one's pretty simple. And then I can click into any of these jobs, for example. And here I am. Um, you can see spin up environment attaching the workspace. Um, but first I'll just quickly go to config and then we'll go back to look at the test summary. So in the config, I just want to point out like, you know, similar here, I'm making a directory, I've got just a file. And then you can see the persistent workspace is right here. It's very similar to the slide. And then I have a couple jobs here. I have test A and test B. You can see the attaching of the workspace. And a very similar kind of match for the contents of the file. And then at the bottom, it's a little bit different, but quite similar where, you know, I'm not gonna deploy unless you know, everything else ran and passed, for example. So if I go back to the test summary tab, um, you know, I could expand the attaching. You can see it's downloading workspace layers here. Um, and then you can see where it did the actual check. Um, so it's, it's a pretty simple example, but you know, what you attach and persist, you know, you can have many, many layers and um, actually, when I look at the caching example, I have another example of workflows that at least is a little bit more, I mean, there's more layers. So, um, and just to remind you, absolutely, if you have questions, particularly on workflows, it would be great um, to put them in the Q&A and I will keep an eye on them. And I think I'll come back, okay, how to do them? Just reading, I'm reading some of your questions, so. Um, oh yeah, so, <clears throat> so Rick had a, has a question about how do downstream jobs reconcile workspaces if upstream jobs are in parallel? So a really good question. And um, so there's a, what's the word? I wanna say strict hierarchy, I'm wondering. Yeah, pretty much strict hierarchy, for example. Um, and one of our blog posts goes into like a ton of detail around, um, okay, like what if these run in parallel and then this requires that? And it, it kind of talks around, um, maybe I'll just bring it up and show, show you it because it has the diagrams that kind of like go into that. And then I do, yeah, on my resources slide, I actually link to that blog post. Um, so let me, let me jump to that. Um, or actually I can just probably search for it. All right, give me one second and I'll find that page for you. 
because now yeah, it's a good question and it's something so i'm just searching in another window to get the right url so give me one second and i'll i'll find that i'm kind of a visual visual person so um there it is i think i found it let's see make sure i have the right yeah this one so i'm just going to copy that head back over to this relevant window, add a tab. Let's see. Yeah, so. So this is for Rick's question. So this I do think I linked to it in the resources page, but it does a deep dive into workspaces basically. And if I scroll down here, um, it's a really good post because for me, I, I, some of that I hadn't even thought about before, but it really explains how, okay, if these run first or this requires first, it explains like you need to be sure, for example, that a downstream job like will see what you're, you're hoping to get from the workspaces. Like, um, so it gives a lot of good examples, um, gives a lot of good advice and, and goes through it like, can you be sure that like this downstream job, job D will, like will B always be finished? So um, like, I hope that's helpful. Um, um, but this, this definitely like helped me with that. So um, yeah, good, good question because I think, well, I mean, yeah, that's something I've also talked about or wondered about myself. Yeah. I wonder, I'm looking at Eric's question. He has a question about um, where the first instance saves to workspace, second restores, and then in the third, in the line downloads the workspace twice. And I'm wondering, Eric, oh, you, you, went, you put another one saves the workspace, then two downloads those workspace, or then three there. I, I'm wondering, Eric, if job three, for instance, like, is it the exact same workspace layer? Um, because, um, and I'll show, I think my caching example has a, a good example of different layers and workspaces. I'm wondering if it's like literally like a duplicate. Um, so we can look at that. Um, and I'm also wondering if it's cloud or maybe, you know, we can look more closely at your exact example cloud. Oh yeah. So. Um, so in part three, job three, all right, does it, is the download and downloads again, is it the exact same layer? Because I know that when you say in job one, you add a layer, job two, you add a layer, job three, you add a layer. When you go to job four and then retrieve them, you get all three of those downloading. So it's that whole overhead of tarring. Um, and I might have a better, example of that when I, after the caching section. So I'm just going to, uh-huh, cool. Thanks, sorry for clarifying that. Yeah, and at the, in the resources slide, I'll also put, uh, I have our supported Surface CI, and so I'll be monitoring that for a, anything coming from the webinar as well, particularly like if you have your own build links and stuff. But um, yeah, so I think I will, I will go on to the caching section. And then once I do that, we'll, I'll come back to questions and have another look. Okay. Back over here. Good questions though. Definitely. So I'm just going to move on to caching and I'll check back on the Q&A after this section. So here we have that diagram just um, highlighting now caching. So you can see caching does live um, past workflows. Um, or after workflows, however you would put that. And it's going um, the same job in different workflows. So that's kind of the distinction with caching. And that's why it's used a little differently. So it lets you, so you're, you're reusing the data from previous jobs. And then after this initial job run, future instances of the same job, well, hopefully they'll run faster um, by not redoing work. So a good example being package dependency managers. You've got Yarn, Bundler, or Pip, for example. 
And then once these dependencies would be restored from cache, these commands like uh, yarn install, it would only need to download new dependencies if there are new dependencies. Um, so not re-downloading some for every single build. Um, and then it's, it's important to think about like, so what dependencies, you know, are important? Um, like what are the, the libraries your project depends on? Um, so you can cache the libraries that are installed with pip in Python or NPM for Node. Um, just a couple of examples. Um, we have lang language guides in our documentation for 2.0 um, called like demo apps. And you would be able to see in each demo, that demo app for each language. Um, you can see like on GitHub, like actual sample projects where you can actually see kind of like how you might use caching. So I find those are really, really handy because you're probably, you want to zone in in the language you're coding in and, and understand it in that. And then tools that are not required for your project, you can store them in a Docker image, right? Um, we have a lot of pre-built Docker images um, you know, that have a lot of what you might need. Like for instance, um, our Ruby image, right? That has things like, like Git, um, gzip, open SSH client pre-installed. So um, they're available and something to think about if your image is like somewhat more generic. So that's like something to think about when you're trying to think how to use caching or maybe you put it in the Docker image. So this is, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so this is an example of using caching. Um, so cache stores a hierarchy of files under a key. So you can see in this case, the key is, is my cache. So we add the save cache. That's our, our step that we add to a job. And the path for directories, that's relative to the working directory of your job. But you can use an absolute path if you, if you like. So in this case, you can see it's got my file.txt, and then it's got a whole, in this case, directory of dependencies. That's just like a little snippet. And then I have another on the next slide to show um, this example updates a cache if it changes by using a checksum of pom.xml. So you can see the restore cache. And we're gonna look at both those steps. I have in like a real world example of CircleCI's front end. And um, we can see, we'll go have a look at the config.yaml and we'll go have a look at the workflow. And then just to remember, there are mutual caches. So we have, especially on the caching documentation, it gives some really good examples of like how we might use a version prefix um, so that you can regenerate all your caches by incrementing the version of this prefix. And um, like as a rule, you wanna preserve the rel reliability of your build, not risk a corrupted build, right? So, I mean, I think that would be the overarching principle when you're, when you're planning that. So you really wanna balance these gains in performance, but you wanna maintain a really high level of reliability. Okay, so I'm gonna head over again and we'll look at like a real build in, in CircleCI. So I think it's this tab. Yeah, so this is our front end. And I think, I'll show you the workflow view first because that kind of shows you all the jobs that are building. So I can click here under workflow to see that. So a little bit more interesting than my workflow example, right? Because we have a lot more parallelism going on. Um, how many is there? Yeah, there's seven. So, so this is that view, right? Workflow and each of these are jobs. So, you know, um, let's see, let's click into this one. Oh, and I wanna show you the configuration as well. And so I'll come back to this, but you can see how I've got multiple restoring cache steps, saving cache, saving cache. So just have a quick look at the actual configuration. And this one also uses workspaces. So we've got, actually what you will see um, a lot is um, both. You'll see both being used in a build quite a bit. 
coming back here. So we're familiar with our attached workspace. And as I scroll down, you can see restore cache, restore cache multiple times there, right? Because we saw them in the build steps. And then I just like to show the very bottom of the workflow as well. I'm going to scroll all the way down. This is a longer config file. OK, so I'm just going to because so every job, I'm just going to scroll really fast to get to basically down here, like um, the workflow section. So you can see, here it is. Oh, it's really long because there's so many jobs. But um, we're sorting out the jobs. And we're sort of saying, like, what requires what and what can run together. Like, that's kind of it in a nutshell. So if I go back to my test summary, I can just expand a few of these um, restoring cache. Um, so you can see I found a cache here, found a cache here, um, saving a cache here. So kind of like it's just to give you a flavor of um, how it looks in your config.yaml, how things look in the actual test summary, um, more of an overview of like how a workflow looks. Um, let's see. Let me go back to the workflow and look at one other one. Like say we look at this one, because each of those jobs will show like their unique uh, test summary. And in this one, if you look here, let me see attaching workspace and um, kind of similar to the, the question for work, workspace workflows, you can see all the layers. Like there is definitely an overhead to the tar on tar. Let's see. I'm just having a look at the Q&A while we're here because we kind of, um, oh yeah, Eric's there too. Okay, okay. Yeah, so you can see there's an overhead to that and then it, and I know I feel like I'm just, or I'm just going to come back to Eric's question for a minute. Um, that that can be sort of surprising to people um, that it's an all layer thing when you're downloading the workspace layers. Um, it's all of them. So you can imagine if you had, for you know whatever reason, persisted 10, 20, 50 things, then there's, there's this, this big, then there's like, you know, all those layers are getting on hard for you. So there's definitely, uh, definitely an overhead. So that's part of why I was saying at the beginning, like rethinking about what's best to use and also like trying it out. Um, so just looking at, so Jason's question, why would you attach workspaces instead of using cache? Why would you attach workspaces instead of using cache? Yeah, I mean, Basically, if it's just something for, say, workspaces, that you, you don't need it beyond this workflow, for example. And there's some kind of something built in a previous job that is used for the next one. Um, I mean, it's like it's a short-lived thing. And then um, you could use workspaces for that. But that's not to say, Jason, that like you couldn't utilize cache. So some things are a little gray area in which we use. So there's not um, necessarily like, oh, that can only be done with caching or that can only like, so there's a little bit of trial and error to it. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, just having a look at some of the other ones. Yeah, see, Eric's just asked, for the same amount of data, which one is faster? Saving and restore workspace or caching? Yeah, um, I don't think I have a cut and dried answer for that one because they're doing kind of a similar operation, right? Um, and so my, my answer, which may not be like exactly what you're looking for, but is to, to literally try it out. And um, do like, like if it was me, I would do two branches in my, um, whether you're Bitbucket or GitHub or whatever. And I would just like, you know, change my, file to use my config.yaml to do both. And then I would try it that way. Um, because some of that, you know, some of it does depend. Yeah. And let's see, just looking at another question here. Oh, 
Oh, about like um, Jared asked, when you save cash, how long does it persist? Um, I mean, I believe it's just, it, it's just within, yeah. Actually, that's a good question. I'll have to, oh, I'll have to, Eddie's doing it. Maybe Eddie can answer that one for me as well, because I'd have to look it up. I, I, it's not particularly long-term, like it's something that comes up when we go to the artifacts section that aren't necessarily guarantees about how long they persist, but I don't know if there's like a specific, um, time period or how, how is it, like for instance with caching, and I think I talk about it, yeah, on the previous slide, like I have a feeling it hangs around, it has something to do with like the machine, the host it runs on, and like, so some people definitely want to like clean and scrub caches by changing the numbering system, um, so don't like have a cut and dry, dried answer to that. Um, cool, and thank you Eddie, I see you're answering questions already, um, lots of them, so that's really helpful. And um, yeah, so I'll come back to questions after the next section. So, um, and then I believe we can, I think there was an answer about the slides. We can share the slides um, if, you know, people want them, of course, because I think probably the resources slide is handy to have as well, right, to have the, the links to documentation. So let's see. Okay, so that was caching um, and then artifacts. So with artifacts, this is my, my last meme, but okay, we store them a little bit longer, a little bit safer. They go into Amazon S3 for storage. So that's where they will live. And you can see artifacts in the diagram. This is the one that lives on past, um, past workflows, past jobs, like it, it lives longer if that makes, makes sense. So, um, so these will persist longer. Um, you know, it's for storage of the output of your um, build process. And if a job produces persistent artifacts, like the examples of being like screenshots, coverage reports, core files, uh, tarp, things for your deployment process, then CircleZI can automatically save and link them for you. And other examples of common use would be, you know, jar files, if you have them as the output of your Java build and test process. Or, you know, it could be a project um, package as an Android app. You got your .apk file that you would upload to Google Play. This is a couple of examples. And then into the nuts and bolts of like, how does that look? You can see here, I'm using store artifacts. And you can do this as many times, but in this case, we've got um, this, in this case, the store artifacts step uploads two builds artifacts. There's a file artifacts dash one and a directory, which is temp artifacts. Um, there's no limit on the number of store artifacts a job can have. Um, it currently has two keys. You've got path and you got destination. So path, you can see, is a file or directory to be uploaded as artifacts. And then destination, which is actually optional, that's a prefix that would be added to the artifact paths in the artifacts API. So uh, the directory of the file specified in path would be used as the default. So let's see. The artifacts tab, I'm going to show that to you in like our actual, in actual build. But um, just to be aware that there is an artifacts tab on the jobs page. Um, as we said, they are stored in Amazon S3. And we don't make guarantees about like how long artifacts are available for them. So if you're relying on them, you know, as a source of like long term, your documentation, persistent content, then we would recommend deploying it to like a dedicated output target. Um, and then just to note that there is a three gigabyte curl file, curl file size limit. So just another thing to bear in mind. So with my artifacts example, it's really just to show, um, let's see. So we can see, let's scroll down. So different things with artifacts here. 
it's toward, usually towards the, the end of the build. But you can see there's these like three items, we're uploading them. Let me show you that in the config.yaml before we, before we look at the actual artifacts tab. Just trying to tell my notifications. Okay, so scrolling down. You can see this one also uses caching, right? And we've got the save cache and the restore cache. But then um, this is kind of what we're looking for for this example is um, the store artifacts. You know, that's how you use it. You can use as many of these as you like. So if I go to ah, the artifacts tab, so it just looks like that. There they are. Um, it's more like to, so you're aware that that exists, you know, for artifacts. Um, and then just looking at where is the workspace catching examples repo? Um, I think for that, oh, I see Matt. Oh yeah, I'm gonna ask him. Yeah, I think for that, let me show you what I meant by that. Um, it is our, I think what it's when I was alluding to, like we have examples in each um, language or a lot of languages. And I think I have, I'm just gonna go back up my slides because I think I have the link for that somewhere. Yeah, I do. Let me grab that and show it to you. This is from um, Morgan. Good question, Morgan, I'll just show you now. I'll show you how it looks. I'm just copy pasting and come back. So I will put that open a new tab and take out the dot. So I think if I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, this is what I was talking about, Morgan, um, the 2.0 sample applications. We have them in a ton of languages and then there'll be actual, like you could fork it, run it, change it, mess, like um, you know, play with the config.yaml. So I think hopefully that answers your question. Um, and you can see at least that's what I was alluding to earlier. Um, let's see. And yeah, feel free for to ask any other questions. Um, let's see. So I think, let me go back to where we were. We had done artifacts. And then basically some things to keep in mind. So it's more like an in summary. Um, so being specific about what you persist to your workspace, um, you know, there's no point, this is an overhead to this tarring on tarring, right? Do so you want to avoid doing that with data you're not going to need downstream? And then not storing the same data in cache and workspace, because you could, right? You could use them both in the same config.yaml and, you know, end up doing the same thing twice. So it's just, you know, bearing that in mind with the cost. And then use artifacts for any data produced by workflow that you wanna be able to access outside of CircleCI after the workflow is finished. So the artifacts you're just thinking in a longer term, longer term picture. And uh, you really wanna highlight like some of the links and the resources. And um, so a lot of what I've talked about today actually comes from those two blog posts. Um, and I actually think I opened up the second one, this one here in response to a question. I don't remember if it's Eric's question um, or not, but I think it was. And uh, so those two just are really good examples. They're kind of like um, a lot of what's in the presentation. Um, although there is some, some things that come directly from our documents. Um, so I wanna, maybe I'll open up just a couple just to show you what our documentation pages look like. So let's see. So workflows, um, you can just see there's an awful lot, right? It explains um, and gives a lot of examples. There's even a video. And um, I think examples are, are the way a lot of people learn. So I like that there's so much there. So that's workflows. and then. Caching artifacts and the 2.0 landing page. 
So there's your familiar diagram of caching. Um, different examples with source caching, clearing the cache, and using keys and how you would use them. So just to know that they're there. And then artifacts similar. Um, with this one, we opened up this one, which was the deep dive into workspaces. But this persisting data blog like that is like kind of the inspiration for the whole presentation, basically. Like it's really good. Um, so, and then the support email. Um, let's see. Let's see. The support email. I was thinking if you guys, you know, had further questions or something, or you want it to be really specific and we're on cloud, and you were like, you know, I have this specific build or workflow, or whatever. Um, and you wanted us to have a look, like that would be the email that I would use. Um, we have a great support team around the world that are, you know, really on and asking, answering your questions and stuff. And I just used the example of sharing the actual link to your job with your cloud, because in, in which case it's easier, right, to, for us to go look at it. But of course, server customers too, um, you can, ask your question. We have a, a way with several questions of getting support downloads to get more information. But usually with these kind of questions when it's to do with data and workflows, caching, it's, you know, you can have a screenshot or just explain a part of your config.yaml or anything around that. So, um, yeah, I'll just have another look at the questions and see what else is there. Let's see. And thank you, thank you for your support. Let's see. Um, Eric, for yours, the caching key name, the caching key name unique for project or for organization. I'd have to look that up. Um, I'm trying to think for project or for organization. And it's a good question, and just off the top of my head, I would have to look it up. I guess um, if you tried under the same org, I guess we could, it's something you could test out as well to see if it having the same name caused issues. But um, that's when we can get back to you by uh, Eric. Or if you want to just ping it at su support at circleci.com, I'll have a look after and uh, go find you in that, in our tickets, if that's helpful. Uh, let's see, what else have we got? Um, just looking at those questions. Uh -huh. Thanks, 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 Eric. <clears throat> and then, let's see. And I'm just looking at um, Andrew's question. If I'm trying to search for caches from most specific to less specific, as in examples with the Shaw branch, Name, should I try upload all three, all three caches in every workflow? Hmm. I don't know if I fully follow, like I know, let me bring up the caching. Let me go back to the caching example because it does go into like some examples of how to do that, um, which I wonder if they would be helpful. Like you can see how we're using keys. Um, should I try upload all three caches in every workflow? I don't, I don't fully follow. Um, but I'm wondering if, if you and some of the examples would be helpful or um, maybe if you want to give a more like an actual real world example, um, Andre, that we could answer. I just in this moment, I'm not sure um, about like that specific example. All right, okay, I'll have um, Matt keep your Twitter um, address or handle so that we can answer your question. And uh, looking at this one, and Neil, can you do an exclude while persisting? For example, I want to persist everything with this good question. Um, See, persisting. So there's, 
you can be persisting with caching or persisting with workspaces. So workspaces, I'm pretty sure, from what I've seen, is pretty all or nothing with all the layers. But um, I'm wondering with caching if we can be more like granular. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm thinking with caching it might be possible, but with workspaces not, if that's helpful. But um, we if we could also uh, we can also check more specifically to give, make sure I'm not like giving you an incorrect answer, if that's helpful. Um, so if you wanted to also copy paste your question into support at circleci.com, um, I can have a look at what pops up there. You can say it came up during the webinar, Fiona's webinar. Um, so it'll come to me. Um, so I hope that, yeah, I'm just looking to see if there's any new questions. Um, oh yeah, and so, yeah, Matt says we will, we will follow up afterwards. So we have, we're keeping track of the questions we maybe need to follow up. So we have um, Andre as one we, we're going to follow up with specifically. Um, yeah. So I'm just looking to see if any other questions pop up. Um, mm -hmm, Cause we're, we're wrapping up, wrapping up, just looking at the questions still. Um, all right. So for source caching, should we use workspace for sustaining project or should I use cache? In all the examples using cache, but I was wondering why not workspace. So that's for, oh yeah, source code. See, Eric, Eric has these good questions. Um, source code caching is, so yes, almost always um, we end up using, but we actually use the checkout, the checkout for source code caching a lot. There are some examples, or what is the word like? There are some cases where you could use workspaces. Like I've I've seen examples where um, not everything is needed, as in not all the source code is needed, and there's some kind of partial amount. So I've seen people use workspaces spaces for that. But in general, like if it's a if it's an all source code caching, using the checkout option it tends to work better. So I'm giving you like this answer, which is a little bit because it's not as cut and dry for that, but it's like usually. So again, Eric, like I'd say, you could do an experiment with that to see what that overhead is between using workspaces or for instance, the checkout command. So that is it, that's a good question. So by somewhat answered it. Yeah, um, so we're gonna wrap up. Um, I really appreciated all the questions. Um, they're really good. And um, let me go back to the last slide. I mean, the very last slide is like, thank you, which I just said, thank you for joining. But I think the resources slide is, is a really good one to keep in mind that you can go further reading, you might have further questions. There's support at circleci.com. I wanna thank my teammates um, for helping with all the questions. So I know a lot of you got your questions answered live Maybe some of them I, had, I didn't even see, right? So that was really good for um, just special thanks to, to Matt and Eddie and George for that. And thank you so much for joining. And I really hope you'll check our schedule for the next webinars. I think the next one is next week, right? So um, it's just really good to see such engagement and I hope it was helpful. And, um, and thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day and rest of your week. Thanks.